Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this talk by the Blake Society. Um, it gives me immense pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Anissa Rogers, and her talk, The Edge of Human Experience, Blake and Tolkien. I can see that there's a great number of people joining us this evening, and I'm sure, like me, everyone is here to hear the connections between these two great English mythmakers, who for me, are amongst the greatest mythographers that I think this country's ever produced. Um, each of them, in their own way, has created a compelling vision of not simply a kind of fantastical universe, but also then as a way to reflect upon the land and the times in which they lived. Before I introduce Anise, who's going to be delivering this talk today, this evening, um, I'd just like to go through some basic housekeeping items so while the talk is in progress, I would ask that everyone please keep their uh, cameras off and their microphones muted. We'll be going through to stop, you know, to prevent those from being activated during the talk so that we can all enjoy what Anise has to say. That said, at the end of the talk, we'd very much like to invite everybody at that point to switch on cameras, turn on your microphones and engage in questions, conversation and debate about what we'll hear this evening. Um, if you're not familiar with using Zoom, then at the bottom of the screen, you'll find the reactions button and the raise hand function. If you could raise your hand rather than just pitching in, then I'll invite people to ask questions and then for Anise to respond. Also, by the same token, you'll find the link there for the chat button, which you'll be able to answer your questions there. In the heat of um, our discussions, you'll probably find that people on camera tend to get priority. My apologies for that. I'll keep an eye out for as many of the chat questions as I can. So with no further ado, I'd like to pass over to Anise now, who's a PhD scholar at the University of Lincoln. Um, I, in particular, would just like to say how much I'm looking forward to the talk this evening, not having had the opportunity to see Anise present a version of this to the Tolkien Society Oxen Moot earlier this year. So, Anise, over to you to tell us about the connections between Blake and Tolkien's art as part of the edge of human experience. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I'm just going to put my glasses on so I can actually read what I'm going to tell everybody today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully this will all work. It worked earlier. Okay. Screen share. Okay. Jason, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, we can see it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay. So I will, without further ado, I will start. Um, so as Jason said, before I start, um, my apologies to anyone here who attended my talk at Oxamute last month. Uh, some of what I'm going to say will already be known to you. So I'd like to emphasise before I start that I'm not an art scholar. Uh, my knowledge of Blake and Tolkien is mostly through their texts, but so with that in mind, let's begin. First, a bit of a backstory of how we got here. So in, in 2020, I was looking into connections between Blake and Tolkien for a call for papers, trying my hardest to think outside the mythological world building both of them use, when Jason and I had a chat about how Tolkien's visual art looked, quote, a bit like Blake's. And suddenly, I knew what I needed to write about. Thanks, Jason. After a quick search on artistic influences of Tolkien, and those that Blake influenced, I realised there was a bit of a connection, but it was clear that no one had put them together. So Tolkien and Blake were linked through their art, but it was all indirect and came through other artists and artistic groups. So the following talk comes from the research from my chapter in the upcoming book, The Romantic Spirit in the Works of J.R.R. Tolkien, edited by Will Sherwood and Julian Alman. Um, for a much more detailed version of what I'm going to tell you, check it out when it comes out, hopefully, in December. So, as I stated earlier, the artistic links between Blake and Tolkien are not direct. Here we have Blake, who influenced the Pre-Raphaelites, the Arts and Crafts Movement, Art Nouveau, and to some degree, William Morris. These artists and movements then influenced the visual art of Tolkien, thus creating an 
indirect yet mainly linear link between Blake and Tolkien. We'll return to this a bit later. What connects Blake with Tolkien most clearly is their use of the imagination, especially when con con connected to the idea of perception. So let us consider the imagination and perception in each of the artist's own words. So we'll start chronologically with Blake. Uh, for someone renowned for complicated imagery and non-understandable ideas, Blake's infamous words from the marriage of heaven and hell are almost uncharacteristically clear. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. So Blake's idea that how we perceive the world can be cleansed suggests an active role on the part of the viewer. The imagination, of course, continued to be important for Blake, and here, more than 20 years later, he explains that the imagination is not a state, it is the human existence itself. Thus, perception and imagination are something with which we much engage in hope of living a full and rewarding life. So what Blake called the doors of perception, Tolkien calls the great fairy. Without going into too much debate regarding Tolkien's ideas about imagination and fancy, let us simply look at his idea of fairy. Fairy cannot be caught in a net of words, for it is one of its qualities to be indescribable, though not imperceptible. As with Blake, it is perception that takes centre stage. Fairy must be able to be perceived. But this perception can create a dangerous place in which one might get lost. The realm of the fairy tale is wide and deep and high and filled with many things in that realm a man may perhaps count himself fortunate to have wandered, but while he is there, it is dangerous for him to ask too many questions, lest the gates be shut and the keys be lost. Fairy, then, is a state of mind, a way of perceiving the world, albeit a potentially risky one. But, as with Blake, it requires an active imagination on the part of the audience. So perception and imagination are linked then and are both of great importance to Blake and Tolkien. But how does this connect with their visual art? The answer is to go through romanticism. Romanticism, it's that big word used about Blake, Wordsworth, Byron and others. But no one is entirely sure what it means. A notoriously slippery concept created by others who came after those that we now consider romantic Romanticism is difficult to define in literature and even more fuzzy in visual art. But it's through Romanticism that we can see how Blake's art indirectly influenced Tolkien's. So what is Romantic art? For the sake of this talk, I'm going to go with Naomi Billingsley, who says, in visual art, Romanticism is an attempt to picture the experience of the world reimagined through visionary perception. Thus, the romantic image is an experience of being in the world, not a record of things in the world. So, at its simplest, romantic artists create or recreate an experience of the world, or because we're considering Tolkien and Blake and their world buildings, where we're, uh, world buildings, a, a world rather than the world, in which an audience finds something through how they perceive it. This reimagining or recreation depends entirely on the ability of the audience to recognize the motifs and symbols being employed by the artist. In the words of Tolkien, this visionary perception, i.e., fairy, should not be imperceivable, just indescribable. Like romantic art, it should be able to be perceived. So Viz Comey puts this very simply when he states that Blake deliberately exercised the viewer's imagination. He did not deliberately frustrate it. I'm not going to argue with him at this point. So Blake recognised the importance of his art being able to be understood by his audience, at least to a degree that it is not incomprehensible. So let's, to examine this, let's look at Blake's words on time. The Greeks represent Kronos or time as a very aged man. This is fable, but the real vision of time is an eternal youth. My vision is also infected and I see time aged, alas, too much so. Blake may not have enjoyed being infected by this view, 
but his ability to recognize it demonstrates an understanding with his viewers that for them, time and old man are intimately connected. So Blake wanted his viewers to work for their understanding of art, to exercise their minds, and they needed to do this by cleansing the doors of their own perception. So here it is important that we remember that Blake is an artist who wrote and Tolkien a writer who drew, and such their views on art differ. One such view that Tol is that Tolkien saw words as the, the key to art and to fairy, although as much cloud and small state in the imagination as the mental power of image making foregrounds the visual. That is, that even words are made visual by the imaginative power of the mind, that words are perceived this way, but the individual perception of the audience relies on visual, even when found in words. They continue to state that Tolkien feared the ability of the visual image to supplant words in the mind's eye, that visual art was even more dangerous than the mental power of image making, for it overwhelms all other parts of the imagination and takes the dominant and permanent position in the mind of the audience. But returning to Tolkien's ideas about the importance of words, it is the individual that is able to find a fair is able to find fairy through the imagination. But whatever Tolkien thought about the power of the visual arts on others, his personal art, that is, most of it, which was later published and perceived as a new way of looking at his extra work, continue to place the importance of perception at the centre. Furthermore, like Blake, Tolkien likes to balance word and image, but I don't have time to discuss that today. But of course, there is more to romantic art than mere perception. For this talk, I shall also focus on recreation and borrowing. As with Billingsley, Colin Trod explains that art is the imaginative remaking of the world, or a world, a recreation. Borrowing is something that Blake and Tolkien do again and again, both from, uh, from their own earlier works as well as from other artists. Without going into detail regarding to uh, Blake's ideas on imitation, we, we know that borrowing was done by multiple artists to Blake, for as stated by Mitchell, Henry Fuseli said that Blake was damn good to steal from. Borrowing was something done to Blake and by him. After all, no artist lives in a vacuum. Another way to consider the idea of perception is through what Rosenblum calls polarity, the mixture of large and small, between the abstract and the empirical, the universal and the specific, and this was common to the art of the Romantic period. Images could be universal and specific at the same time, might say something about society as a whole or the world, as well as a singular moment in the life of the artist. We shall return to these three points again, but let's start with borrowing. Well, as I mentioned for Silly, here's a quick look at two pieces of art. In Hecate on the right from 1795 by Blake, we can clearly see links to Fuseli's The Nightmare from 1781. Um, I've had to highlight the horse in Fuseli's because it's the actual nightmare because it's difficult to see. Um, but we can see that the horse in the nightmare and the donkey ass in Hecate are strikingly similar. Um, I've chosen this picture because here it is Blake that is borrowing from Fuseli rather than the other way round. But uh, borrowing within his, the own works of an artist is much more common in both Blake and Tolkien. So here is the Ancient of Days the frontispiece to Europe, and one of Blake's most famous works. Let's focus here on the old man with the long beard, and just how often Blake returns to such an image. So here we have Urizen from the Book of Urizen, carrying his red lantern or the sun. And this is a thorny crowned Satan from the Second Temptation from the illustrations to Milton's Paradise Regained. And again, here is the same figure as Abraham from the Old Testament pic from the Old Testament picture portraying the story of Abraham and Isaac. And here, we ha finally have him as Elohim or God in Elohim creating Adam. This list is by no means complete. One might consider the penultimate plate in Jerusalem with the depiction of old man God. So the same figure is used here to represent multiple characters. But here, Blaise also makes an, this an inversion of the accepted image of time, 
because had you not known about Blake's ideas about the infected figure of time, then you may also have perceived this character as time. And that would not have been entirely incorrect, but you would have only been perceiving part of the whole. But we can also look at these images through Rosenblum's idea about polarity, returning yet again to Blake's words regarding being infected. Here, Blake can be both abstract and empirical simultaneously. Blake wanted to exercise the mind of his viewer, not deliberately frustrate it. The Ancient of Days is all and none of the different representations of God, Satan, Eurizen, and everything else that the audience may perceive. And of course, we are aware that Blake did different versions of his own works, whether this is in the Songs of Innocence and of Experience or in his illustrations to Milton's Paradise Lost. So like, Tolkien, like Blake, borrows from other artists such as Jenny Harbour. And for a more detailed discussion of this, see Hammond and School's artist and illustrator. But I wish to focus on what Tolkien borrows from himself. I shall discuss this in further detail later with his multiple uses of similar forest images, but perhaps his most famous reworked or self-borrowed image was the tree of Amlion, and I apologise, I'm very bad at pronouncing words, which he drew again and again and again. In this letter, he explains that medieval manuscripts are not, in my not very extensive experience, good on trees. I have among my papers more than one version of a mythical tree, which crops up regularly at those times when I feel driven to pattern designing. They are elaborated and coloured and more suitable for embroidery than printing. So this image is recreated by Tolkien multiple times, but it does not actually have something that it truly represents. This image is all about how we perceive it. So taking the, the idea of romantic art further, Hammond and School discuss that Tolkien's artwork is full of themes such as a gate or a door, a path or road leading to the distance up to a gate or door, a distant view beyond the immediate landscape. They permit movement and escape, which we inherited from the Romantics. Tolkien, like the Romantics then, wanted his viewers, even if it was just himself at the time, to move beyond the picture to perceive the world outside of its borders. And this allows for movement and escape. Much of Tolkien's art is landscapes, for he readily admitted that he was not good at drawing people. He was not good at drawing people. He's not wrong. Um, so here, in the hill Hobbiton across the water, we can follow the road over the bridge at the front of the picture, winding our way past the fields and houses until we escape into the distance like a visual representation of that famous line, the road goes ever on and on. Now, Whilst Tolkien might focus on landscapes, Blake is known for his prominent use of the human body. However, let us look at one of Blake's landscapes. So here in Beatrice on the car with Matilda and Dante from his illustrations to Dante's Divine Comedy, we also follow a path, albeit a river, leading from the front of the picture, drawing the viewer into the world of the painting and beyond. Furthermore, the bending branches of the trees lead the eye to the arched wings just left of the centre of the picture, I've circled it for you here, which suggests a gate or doorway to another place, especially with the figure between them. Here, Blake has the movement throughout the piece as well as the multiple exits that were mentioned by Hammond and Skull. By comparison, Blake's The Blasphemer uses the same techniques in a very different type of picture. Here, we have the two clothed figures at the front of the picture, mirrored by the less defined figures further back, suggesting an indefinite continuation, an example of what Rosenblum calls the universal and the specific. However, we, the viewer, unlike the blasphemer, are able to escape the image, are able to perceive something beyond the picture. The blasphemer himself is in sharp focus with the typical Blakean musculature. And yet, if we follow the line of his body and the direction of his head thrown backwards from the viewer, we can see a moving trail of dark cloud or smoke leading into the distance, pulling us into the indefinite depth found in and beyond the painting. We, the audience, have our exit through the very movement found in the image. And again, we see these techniques if we place a Tolkien piece next to a Blake piece. The river pathway is used in, by Tolkien in Bilbo comes to the roots of the raft elves to create movement and escape beyond the picture, even without us knowing its content. 
context. Again, the trees arch to create an archway or door through which the viewer can perceive their escape. In Blake's Jacob's dream, the same swirling movement is created through the stairway or ladder. The nearer figures are clear and specific, whilst the higher and the further away characters are less explicit and more universally human. Again, an example of polarity. And these figures are escaping into the top of the image. So both of these pictures have romantic tendencies. Another point about perception is this idea of things to be seen as natural. They are, after all, as Billingley explains, an experience of the world, not a record. So let's look at the size of the mushrooms or the toadstools in Mirkwood or the lily on the front page of the Book of Thel. Each is a perception of a world, an image which is both normal and alien. The things being portrayed we perceive as normal, and yet the size of these things is not are not. So let us look a little more closely at Mirkwood. So consider this spider. How do you perceive it? If we forget the context for a moment, we think it large. We perceive it to be abnormal. However, if we come to this picture through the context, we also consider it abnormal, abnormally small. In comparison to the toadstool, this Mirkwood spider is barely a proper arachnid at all. But which view is correct? The answer is, of course, both and neither. It's all about perception. So as Tolkien said, the human mind endowed with, with powers of generalization and abstraction sees not only green grass discriminating it from other things, but it sees that it is green as well as grass. Perceiving the world differently by looking at things in a romantic way, we can see the green grass, the green, the grass, but, every, but also every insect and twig that's not in the picture. I chose this picture specifically because it's in black and white, but we know the colours because we perceive them. This picture is an example of, of Tolkien's use of self-borrowing and recreation, and different versions of this image are used to represent different forests in all three of his major Middle-earth works, the Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, and The Silmarillion. The Silmarillion. So now that we have looked at some romantic similarities between Blake and Tolkien, we should now consider how they are connected, focusing on the pre-Raphaelites and Art Nouveau. I'll start with the pre-Raphaelites for the proof of their connection to both Tolkien and Blake is from textually based evidence rather than artistic. The pre-Raphaelites were a group of artists who rejected the academic classical conventions embodied in the paintings of Raphael. Instead, they strove to create symbolic emotional works. Often their works expressed ideas of beauty, ones that inspired or were in tandem with the arts and crafts movement. So they saw themselves as creating or recreating a new way of perceiving the world through their art. And as Trod states, as represented by Gilchrist, Swinburne and the Rossetti brothers, Blake symbolizes the fusion of perceptual power, artistic creativity, and social connectedness. So Blake was found, or at least made public, through Gilchrist, Swinburne, and Rossetti brothers. And as such, much of the early reception of the late 19th century Blake was through the Rossetti pre-Raphaelite lens. But how do the pre-Raphaelites connect with Tolkien? Well, as Hammond and Skull say, Tolkien biographer Humphrey Carpenter notes that Tolkien once compared his group of school friends, the TCBS, to the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, suggesting an early understanding or connection with that artistic movement. Furthermore, McNellis's comment that Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery contains a major collection of pre-Raphaelite paintings that Tolkien presumably saw during his years at King Edward School, and it would certainly have been known known the murals painted by the pre-Raphaelites in the old Oxford Union debating chamber. So this demonstrates that Tolkien was surrounded by pre-Raphaelite works. So we have the Blakeian connection to the pre-Raphaelites and the pre-Raphaelite connection to Tolkien. There appears to be an indirect, indirect link then from Blake to Tolkien, but of course there are others. One such is William Morris, who cannot really be said to be one of Blake's followers, but his friendship with the pre-Raphaelites, particularly Dante Gabriel Rossetti, brought him into contact with the circle around Alexander Gilchrist that was renovating Blake's reputation in the second half of the 19th century. 
So here we see that there was a Blake Morris connection, even if it did come through the pre Raphaelites. The Morris Tolkien connection is very well documented within Tolkien scholarship, so I'm not going to discuss it here. But we can see how Tolkien was involved with more than just drawing. Even if he was not able to personally create other artistic forms, his acknowledgement that Amlion was more suited both for embroidery than painting demonstrates an understanding of the wider art forms made famous by William Morris and the arts and crafts movement. But the strongest artistic connections come through Art Nouveau, to which Blake was of extreme importance. As Depp states, the critics on Art Nouveau have drawn attention to the debt owed to William Blake, of which two aspects are particularly important. Blake's curving, sinuous line, the line seen in reeds and rushes, in water, in hair and in flames, and Blake's treatment of the page as, as an organic whole, where there must be harmony between text and decoration. I do not have time here to discuss the idea of the page as an organic whole, but the curving sinuous line is so Blakean that it's almost impossible to think of his art without it. Thus, Art Nouveau owes an artistic debt to Blake, and Tolkien owed an artistic debt to Art Nouveau. But, as Hammond and School state, how much he was influenced by contemporary movements or styles in art other than Art Nouveau is a matter of conjecture. We only have to look at Tolkien's favourite of his own art to see the Art Nouveau influence. So, his favourite being um, Bilbo comes to the huts of the raft elves. We can see the long sinuous lines in the water and the tree trunks in the foreground of the picture. By comparison, it's not the water in the sea of time and space by Blake that most draws on the long lines, but the human figures in their hair, the trees, as well as the clouds. But the tree trunks and the roots in both images share features. But ultimately, Tolkien's trees look like Blake's trees because they both have connections in opposing directions to Art Nouveau. So these pieces have connections to Art Nouveau as well as to Romanticism. But Art Nouveau shared other features with Romanticism. Another characteristic of Art Nouveau was the constant, constant repetition of the same motives in design and illustration as, for example, swans and other water birds, reeds, irises and girls' hair. We will find all these characteristics already present in Walter Crane's children's books 20 years or so before the Art Nouveau period. As with the recreation or reuse in Romanticism, Art Nouveau also repeated motifs, designs and symbols, most famously those connected with the natural world. All these were found in the famous book illustrator Walter Crane, who was influenced by Blake's work at a time when he was scarcely known, so that he acted to a certain extent as an intermediary between Blake and the Art Nouveau artists. So, therefore, so with Art Nouveau, the indirect link appears to be Blake, Walter Crane, Art Nouveau, and Tolkien. And the picture on the right is um, one of uh, a woodcut by Walter Crane for Spencer's The Fairy Queen. So, but let us return uh, to the Book of Fell and nature motifs, because the Book of Fell shows it quite clearly. I'm just going to use the uh, the front page of the Book of Fell. So, but the, within, within the whole book, the cloud of clay, the lily and the cloud are shown throughout in clearly Art Nouveau fashion. But this is also true of the I'm going to call them river flames of the, the divine image. I'm not entirely sure if they're a river or flames. I think they're both. Um, and this is from the Songs of Experience, uh, of Innocence and of Experience, published five years later. So we, we see the sinuous lines, the twisting and the curving. So Blake's work shows Art Nouveau tendencies throughout his life. Uh, as we can see by looking at a single use of Blake's very famous flames from one of his last works. So this is an image from Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion, and the long sinuous line is seen in the repeated motif of Blake's famous flames, both of which are key to Art Nouveau. So here we have the nature imagery um, following the sinuous lines and the flames that Blake is most famous for. Um, so perhaps the most famous Art Nouveau no, artist, and please do argue with me here, uh, was Charles Rennie Mackintosh. And when we think of his work, 
we probably uh, imagine the long lilies of his chair designs or his swans or even the famous doors of the Willow Tea Rooms in Glasgow. And it's easy to make connections um, between these and Tolkien's visual art. In fact, illustrators of um, Tolkien often uh, pull on Macintosh um, for their illustration um, of Tolkien's mythological works. Um, but the long sinuous lines and the nature imagery of Art Nouveau are clear in Macintosh's less well-known landscapes, um, such as The Road Through the Rocks, um, which appears to have a strong link with Tolkien's representation of Rivendell. Now, they both have the same long sinuous lines, the curving. Um, they, they, they have similarities. But we should be careful of making such statements and saying there are links without acknowledging that there is no evidence to connect these two works. However, um, I perceive that there is similar there are similarities. So let, let us return to the diagram I gave at the beginning of this talk um, with the added name of Walter Crane. So here we have Blake, who influences the pre-Raphaelites, the arts and crafts movement, Walter Crane, Art Nouveau, and William Morris, who in turn influence Tolkien, thus creating an indirect artistic link. But of course, as always, it is much more complicated than that. So um, for Blake and Tolkien also shared influences or types of artistic sources, most common, um, the Gothic and medieval manuscripts. Um, unfortunately, we have no thorough record of which medieval manuscripts either looked at. We have some record, but not a very deep one, and they didn't look at the same ones. Um, so with that in mind, this shared influences, let's look at one last set of pictures. So uh, this is called dragons, because it's a very Tolkien thing, dragons. Um, so on the right, we see Tolkien's dragon. Um, I'm not going to try and pronounce its proper name. I believe it's some kind of Anglo-Saxon. If anyone can read it, I'm very impressed. Um, and on the left, we have the serpent attacking the USA Donati, or Donati. Donna, Donati uh, from his Dante illustrations. So here, here we go, that, that, there we are. Um, it would be easy to say that Blake's serpent looks quite similar to Tolkien's dragon. I'm not going to say that they look perfectly similar, um, but they both portray twisting sort of knot-like features and have sharp, almost diamond-shaped heads. Um, Tolkien and Blake had similar uh, access to similar sources of medieval artwork but this doesn't make a, a direct connection between the two just sharing sources isn't isn't a connection so here we can see how two historically distinct distant artists may enjoy and reproduce art in a sort of similar way as a response to sources so but such comparisons no states are tempting not least because of the super superficial resemblances. So we've got to be careful in making any links. As Rosenberg states of 20th century artists, they perpetuate romantic motifs and emotions without any awareness of the historical precedent, thus making comparisons between Blake and, and Tolkien not only easy, but easily dangerous. But uh, for as much as Hammond and School's idea that looking for styles outside of Art Nouveau in Tolkien is ultimately fruitless to pursue. It doesn't mean we shouldn't look. I would suggest that it is an indirect, historical, mostly linear correlation that demonstrates how the romantic influence is passed down through multiple avenues in such a way that Tolkien's visual artwork has decidedly Blakean tendencies. And just because we have no direct link between the visual art of William Blake and J.R.R. Tolkien does not mean we should not try to wipe clean the doors of perception, nor turn the key in the gate of fairy. Ultimately, what connects the artwork of Blake and Tolkien is that they ask us, the audience, to try and perceive their visual art in new ways, including ways in which we might connect them.
Thank you.